All right. All right. Thank you so much once again for tuning in for another episode of Uncut. Tonight, we are talking with a few people who we talked to last week, and then we will have some new guests kind of pop in um, if they can get on tonight. But we're still talking about um, overcoming um, depression and battling suicidal thoughts, suicidal ideations. Um, this is something that's dear to my heart. I have personally battled with suicidal thoughts, personally attempted suicide. Um, spirit of depression comes upon me very heavily at times. I have very, very highs and very, very lows. So um, I asked a few friends to jump on with me just to have a candid discussion. Um, you never know who's watching. You never know who's listening. But our prayer is that someone will be helped and will be made all the better because of our conversation here tonight. So I have the lovely Miss Jennifer, AKA Jenna Tisdale with me. Tell the people who you are, where you are and what you do. Hey, I'm Jenna. Um, right now I'm in Kings Tree, South Carolina. Um, you are? Yeah, but tomorrow I'll be back in Tennessee. So uh, no, you gotta go see Sue Ham. Don't leave King Street. <laughs> she's amazing. Um, yeah. Well, you know, I live in two places. It's very complicated. Um, I just got a job today. Uh, I finished the real estate course. So I'm going to be a real estate agent locally. Um, And then, you know, I do acting and stuff on the side. I have um, a tractor supply commercial on Thursday (laughs) and a short film on Saturday. So um, that's about, that's about it. Living in two states, working like crazy. Sweet. You know, dog all right, the apostle, the whole apostle, Jerome Bouverette, tell us who you are, what you do. <laughs> you there? It's frozen. You hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. Yeah, I'm here. Okay. I'm sorry, guys. My internet, for some reason, is jumping. Uh, I'm Apostle Jerome Bouverette. I am uh, just a servant of the Lord, and, you know, I have battled with depression and suicide uh, on several occasions in my life. You know, I'm a living example that doesn't matter calling. You can still have chaos that will try to take you out of your calling. And so um, that is a little bit about me. I'm excited to be here with everybody tonight. Thank you so much, Apostle. Dale, I'm going to call on you. If you can unmute yourself, tell the people who you are, tell them what you do, and uh, yeah. All right, so I'm Dale. Um, I'm actually out with some associates of mine. I'm trying to get some food for everybody right now. Uh, <laughs> praise God, yeah, so. Um, I am Dell, the fitness pastor. I am a health coach and fitness trainer. I'm currently building a business for that. I'm also a stock Bitcoin and for an exchange trader. Um, and I love God. Hey, man, Dell, I need you with that workout tip. We'll talk about that later. I got you. <laughs> hey, I'm going to put myself back on mute real quick just so I can get okay. the food. Okay, sweet. Mr. Maurice Mitchell, thank you so much for joining me tonight. Uh, we're going to jump right in, but tell us who you are, what you do, and where the people can find out more about you. Okay. Hello, everybody. I am Maurice Mitchell. I uh, am a recent published author through Amazon. I just wrote a book um, called um, The Great Endurance, My Journey, My Truth, My Life. And basically, the book is about uh, resilience and survival uh, from the things that I suffered through uh, being abused for two years um, with child sexual abuse and how I endured holding it in for 27 years before my brain literally just popped. Um, Mm -hmm. I dealt with depression, I dealt with suicide, I dealt with the suicide attempt, I dealt with rage, anger, fear, confusion, all 27 years literally every day not even just exaggerating like every day of my life I can remember as a child hating myself I can remember as a teenager Mm -hmm. asking God why am I here I can remember as an adult praying to God asking him to take my life like what's the point and I can say that I am a living testimony because I lived through going to uh health facilities mental health facilities and 
therapy and that's the only reason like with God's help obviously but that's the only yeah. way that I could like get a grasp on what I was going through and dealing with because I started having migraines that were causing me to pass out all of it was too overwhelming but mm. in this book I was able to just let go and free myself it was a healing process of this I call it my survival kit that's what I call the grand doors. It was my survival kit. It's how I made it through. Wow. And that's what I'm hoping that it does for other people. It's on Amazon. Um, you can look it up. The Great Endurance by Maurice L. Mitchell. Um, and Tanita, thanks for the invite. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. We're going to dive into the book a little bit. Um, the way it works, Maurice and Dale, I know y'all are new. I'll kind of throw out a question and we just kind of go around taking turns, answering it. And then we kind of go around again and do the same thing. Um, but the first thing I kind of, I want to jump, last week we jumped to depression first. I want to jump right to the suicidal thoughts and the suicidal ideations, the suicidal attempts. Like there were times where I could literally feel darkness like coming upon me. It was like somebody had put a coat of heaviness or I could feel something like slithering up my back or over my shoulders to where um, there was a voice that would tell me, you know, you need to call your mother, you need to call your mother-in-law, you're unfit to take care of your children, you need to go check yourself into a mental institution. Um, Jenna, what were some of the things when you got to that point that you heard, like what was being said? Um, I don't know that, I mean, it wasn't like an audible voice, but I, mm -hmm. I felt like- The thoughts that something was telling me everyone would be better off without me. Mm -hmm. um, and I was tired. I was, I was just exhausted mentally. Um, but like I said, I had no ambition. I had no excitement or, or anything good happening. So my darkness was more like you, you were a mistake. There's, you're not going to mm -hmm. fulfill your calling. There's, there's no calling for you. Um, everyone would be wow. better off without you. Um, mm -hmm. So that's basically what my feeling was. Maurice, when you got to that point, what were the thoughts? What were the things that you were hearing? Because somebody may be hearing those things and not know what it is. Um, it's hard to pinpoint one thing because I did deal with it for 27 years straight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but one of the main things that really got me down was guilt and shame. Okay. Uh, I guess. But so what did that look control. like? In what did that look like in the form of a thought or an idea or what was being said I, to you mentally? Or I felt guilty because I feel like any other child that suffered that abuse at the hand of the person who did that to me mm -hmm. was my fault because I held it in and didn't say anything. Mm. So I carried that with me, and every day I was like, "Say something," you know. And then even as a kid, I would think someone in my family is going to kill this man. I thought that as an eight and nine year old and I knew it yeah. to be fact. So yeah. I carried the weight of just uh, knowing that other kids were being abused. And I, I'll tell you this, and I did something and I've never mentioned this to anybody. This past January, I did something crazy. I went to the offenders list. There's an app called offenders. Something mm -hmm. told me not to do it. I shouldn't have done it. Uh, and I just wanted to see, you know, if something had happened to this guy, he was still on this, he was on this offenders list. So that mm -hmm. means he was still doing the things, you know, that he was doing to me as a kid. So this is 30 years later. Well, so, I don't know. Well, Maurice, I don't know once you get on the offenders list, if you ever get off. Well, that's true, but I don't even know. Yeah, that's true. But that's, that's the thing that like drove me to like um, my suicidal thoughts because I've, felt unwanted, unneeded. I felt like if I had come out and said something, there are many lives that could have been changed. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, like Jenna was saying, there was like a point of darkness that I probably wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. Mm -hmm. um, I stopped caring. I think that's one of the main things too. When you notice that a person has stopped caring about things. I, about everything. I literally stopped caring about everything. Like mm -hmm. I, I remember one day praying to God and I said, God, at this point, I don't even care if you send me to hell. That's how wow. dark, that's how dark that's huge. my mind was. And even now thinking about it, I can't imagine thinking that or saying yeah. it, but I, yeah. I can remember praying that out loud. God, 
if you kill me today and I go to hell, it must have been your will. I just stopped caring wow. about life. So if I've, I've noticed that if I ever found out somebody's like, well, I just don't care. Not that I'm going to pinpoint that it's suicidal, but I'm just going to try and keep my mind, you know, keep my thoughts and prayers to, towards that person to, you know, they yeah. might be start of, you know, something suicidal or some depression, you know, some form of depression. Yeah. 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 I want to jump to Dale. If you can unmute, I know you guys are driving Dale. Um, at the point of suicide, what what's going through your mind? What did you hear? What was being said? What thoughts, what ideations were just kind of hanging out? Okay, so at the point of suicidal thoughts specifically for me, it was nothing. It was blank. Like my whole wow. life was just surrounded by darkness. And that's because um, like they previously mentioned, you don't care. You literally mm. do not care about anything. At that point, all you're looking at is wanting an escape. All At that point, all you're looking at is the pain that you're surrounded by and how you want out of it. Wow. So like he previously mentioned, like he didn't care if God sent him to hell. For me, it got to that point where it was like, it's, it's either do or die. Wow. So it was like looking at, when you say nothing like a black curtain, like I can't see anything past this. Yeah, your, your, your mind is like completely clouded by nothing but darkness. Wow. It's like every, every thought, and that's like you said, you get tired. That's what gets you tired is because you get tired of thinking about negativity. You get tired of thinking about the same thoughts over and over where it's nothing but negativity and suicidal thoughts or how I can get out of it, especially when you feel like you cannot get out of it. Yeah, yeah. Bouverette, what was it like for you at that point of suicide or suicidal thoughts? Um, well, for me, uh, I, I experienced it, number one, the first time um, when I was a teenager, I was 12. Um, mm -hmm. My biological father had just died. Um, I was the oldest. Uh, there was nine years between me and my brother. And uh, um, within a year, uh, my mom will remarry. And um, that for me as a teenager was a very difficult thing to deal with. Number one a positive role model of which I did not have any and um, my my suicidal thoughts at that uh oh you froze up on us we'll come back Bouverette yeah <laughs> he totally got kicked off all right, Jenna, I want to go to the next question. What does, th there are a lot of people who are depressed, but they mask it. And so a lot of people will say, you know, people smile outside, they smile at work, they, they smile when they're around friends or whatever. And there are people who literally go home and they put the covers over their head. Um, what type of things would you say, or what did you use as a mask, if you will, to mask like the pain, the depression, the suicidal thoughts, like when you were around the kids or when you were around family, like what was your mask? Um, like I said, when I was at my worst, um, where I considered suicide, I had no, um, no emotions, no, no feelings. I was just empty. Um, but coming out of it, I think that I masked it with helping people, um, just trying to be valuable to someone, um, helping strangers, helping other people. I think that I covered it a lot by doing good deeds or wow. just being useful to people. And at that point too, I started to realize that a lot of people are hurting. Probably everyone's hurting in some way or another. So sure. yep. I wanted to be able to be some kind of light to them. Yeah. I think for me, I masked it with sex um, and um, probably 
misdefining or defining inappropriately sex as intimacy because it wasn't. And I thought the more sex, the less depressed and suicidal and that like that would give me purpose because you love me and those who have sex with you have to love you, you know, to some extent anyway. Um, and then I think a lot of people use comedy. So they're always, they want to be the life of the party or they, they are always the jokester and they're always like, you know, just acting a fool wherever you go. And you're like just the biggest goofball in the group. Mm -hmm. But in reality, that person is really suffering silently. Maurice, what did you use to mask the pain? You said 20 something years. That's a long time. Yeah. So you pretty much uh, mentioned what I used. Um, even as a kid, I became the class clown. Okay. I became I became uh, the jokester of the family. My family knew me as, you know, wow. the one that can always make everybody laugh. Um, yeah. Even in school, going into college, people would say, oh, I'm not going to that party if you're not going. You know, you're the life of the party. You know, oh. you're that guy. So you really hit the nail on the head with that one for me. And that's what I used. Um, and at the same time, it was like, without it, I felt like I couldn't survive. You know, mm. that was my point of survival, just being wanted around yeah. you know what i'm yeah. saying feeling like i was needed feeling necessary so i used comedy i mean and then it and it became a part of my personality over the years yeah you know what i'm saying it, was, it became something natural but at first it was forced nobody knew it even at work people are reading my book and they're like you always you're always positive you write all these yep. positive quotes on the board we can't believe that you went through that you know you just never know what somebody's going through and it was def definitely music and comedy is yeah. what I use. Music. I didn't think about music. Wow. Yeah. Okay. All yeah. right. Sweet. Dale, what Dale, what would you say you mask the pain with day to day so that people would know you were battling these things? Um, I was actually sitting here. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we yeah, you good. Okay, making sure. I was actually sitting here thinking about it while um he was talking. And for me, I believe it was money. Because money. I know that's not, yeah, that's not the typical one. But for me, it was like actually going to work and trying to occupy with myself with as many jobs as I could. Mm -hmm. That way I didn't have to think about it because I felt like money would be that escape. Uh, I started to lose faith. And I was like, if, I feel like if I can't uh, rely on God, which was false because I hadn't even tried God yet. So wow. for me, it was like, if I can't depend on my faith, then I'm going to do this myself. I'm going to depend on myself. And I'm going to depend on money and I'm going to try to get as much money as I can try to, to try to escape this depression that I'm in. Wow. Bouverette, are you good? You look frozen. <laughs> I'm trying to see if he's back on. If not, I'm going back up to Maurice. Nope, he just fell off again. <laughs> Boy, technical difficulties are a trip trying to do these Zooms. One day we'll be live in person, in color, face to face. <laughs> All right, Jenna. Here, here's where I want to go now. I want to go all the way back to childhood because I think, no, I know. I know that childhood played a key part for me in the depression and the suicide. And so I was born to a 14-year-old mother. Um, word on the street was that I was supposed to be aborted for whatever reason. She was not successful at that. Um, but for most of my life, I heard things like I could no longer have birthday gifts because I had you. Um, I can no longer have Christmas gifts because I had you. Um, the people who do things for you only do things for you because they're my friends. They're not your friends. They're my friends. Um, even to this day, whatever I do, it's you're successful as a writer because I sowed that seed into you. And you're successful as a playwright because I used to write plays and I used to act. And um, you're successful as a speaker because I used to speak. And so there's always this this pull of um, not being good enough and that whole issue of that one word we say unwanted mm -hmm. um, is always lingering in the forefront. What role would you say your parents or parent, if it was a single parent household, played in leading up to the points of depression and suicide? Um, I don't think that my parents played a big role in that. Um, our family was very close. I didn't have a traumatic childhood, but I feel like, oh, really? Okay. <laughs> I feel like there's always, uh, my trauma happened when I was an adult. I think that's why it was so traumatizing. Okay. Me, because it was like, I lived one life and then suddenly everything wow. I believed about myself was spin upside down. Um, mm -hmm. and mine was all because of a relationship. And I think a lot of times, um, 
you can't, sometimes you can't prevent who is in your life. Um, this person was a totally different person when we first met, mm-hmm. when I found out I was pregnant, basically he became a psycho. Everything about me was wrong um, from like head to toe. I mean, I can't even tell you the ridiculous stuff he would say about me to make me just feel like I was not even human. He once told my parents that he should get a government check for me because I'm so stupid. Wow. (laughs) Whoa. He he said very, very terrible things about me constantly. So um, it was very, very rough. But growing up, which is strange, um, this is the first time I'd ever let someone into my life that I guess was just such a negative vibe that they can can control and change the way you think. Mm -hmm. Um, And you were with this person how long? I was with him for about four years. Okay. Um, But growing up, when I was 12 years old, I I read the book of Proverbs, the entire book of Proverbs every single day. I was obsessed with wisdom. So I knew to guard, guard my heart. Like I did everything I was supposed to do, but this person, I feel like tricked me. Like, and then I was trapped because I depended on him financially. I was having his child. Mm. Um, so that's kind of how my whole world turned upside down. But after that, it's like, I would let, I would become friends with people. Um, I've had a yeah. couple of best friends since him that had that same kind of, it's almost an evil negativity where they plot against you. You, you yeah. think that you're in this relationship and you guys love each other, whether you're friends or spouses or whatever but they're secretly trying to destroy you. Um, right. So I've, I've, I've kind of learned my lesson, hopefully. Wow. With that. Wow. But I've had, since him, I've had a couple of people in my life whom I thought were, you know, we were ride or die friends and then they end up in prison and, and weird, weird, wow. crazy things. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I think um I, I think as you was no, I know as you were saying, Jenna, some friends, they don't necessarily become enemies, they just can't go. And right. I think that's easier said than done. Um, and I had to get to a place where we don't necessarily look at someone who has walked out of our life necessarily as an enemy. Um, but they I wouldn't call them friends. You know, if right. I see them on the street, I still speak, but right. there's no relationship. But you're not letting them in. Yeah. 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 Like you're on the outer circle, not the inner circle. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. I learned my lesson. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So Maurice, what role would you say your parents played in leading up to the suicidal thoughts, depression, all of that? Um, wow. I don't even know where to begin. Um, uh, my mom didn't play a role in it. Um, she was actually, you know how moms just have that. Uh, most moms, I should say, or some have that. Just <laughs> you can't even say most. These, these like, right. Days. They just, <laughs> sometimes they just know something's wrong with their child. Yeah. And my mom would always say, are you OK? You know, what's going mm-hmm. on with you? And I would I would use something that I was dealing with that day to make my mind say that I was OK. So in my mm-hmm. mind, I wasn't lying. I'm like, yeah. I'm OK. But in the back of my head, I'm thinking about things that happened that day. So my mom mm-hmm. didn't play a role, but my dad, um, I oftentimes growing up thought about him not being around Mm -hmm. um, after their divorce. Um, That was tough. But I guess the main person was my abuser because this was um, somebody that um, my brother's not. Family member? So my mom at the time was 27 years old. It was her boyfriend's cousin. Okay. He was always around. He was, um, he played basketball for college. He mm-hmm. um, was tall. He's six four, mm-hmm. um, and played basketball. We looked up to him. He played video games with us. He was like our superhero, literally. We couldn't wait mm-hmm. till he came around. So I gained his trust. I trusted him like, you know, he was my father or yeah. like a pastor or somebody, you know, as a kid, you just couldn't wait till somebody came around. He was that person. Mm-hmm. Um, and then just the way that he constructed my mind as far as what love was and what trust was. And as I got older, looking back, I was just like, wow, like you just like literally destroyed my entire thought process about what yep. love is and what trust is. Mm-hmm. Um, and the only reason, and if you would forgive me if I smile, because that's like one of the ways that I not cry. <laughs> yeah, no, you did. You're so, good. Through, so I have to smile through what I'm about to say. So, but it's like horrible, but I have to smile. Yeah. Um, 
this is a man who I trusted that it started off as like molestation mm -hmm. and then it turned into like uh, actual sexual penetration and okay. oral and just yeah. like everything as I got older that I felt that he should be doing with a woman, um, he right. did to me. He would do. Uh -huh. And so as a kid, not, not knowing what it was and being confused, but scared, you know, at the same time, mm -hmm. this person just like literally drove my mind into like a pit I felt like as I got older looking back and then when I got in the fifth grade and learned about sex education that's when the light bulb clicked on like yeah. wait a minute something is like, off yeah so it wasn't until like that was third and fourth grade during the abuse but fifth grade that following year was when we had sex education and that's when it was just like whoa like I was literally like raped or I was literally you know penetrated and this he did this and he did that and that pushed me into further suicide suicidal mm -hmm. thoughts and depression because and then I started thinking crazily I started thinking like oh my god and this is something that I, I'm kind of ashamed to admit but I thought it I kept saying to myself dang why couldn't it be a woman you know because I was ashamed as a man you know I growing it. up and it, yeah. and, it, and it made me more shameful you know what I'm saying? As far as like trying to talk to my best friends about it, I, I felt like I couldn't talk to my best friends about yeah, it. Yeah, because it was a man. In middle school, because it was a man. And I would mm -hmm. feel like it was, you know, disgusting to them as it was to me, but more disgusting mm -hmm. because, you know, it was like shunned. You know, I would be shunned. And I don't know. That's but, what but Maurice, drove me crazy. Yeah, but Maurice, so I want to stop you because you said a lot. But one thing I want to piggyback on is isn't it amazing how the enemy will flip the shame onto us and we didn't do anything? Like we didn't initiate because I was molested by a female cousin, okay? And the same thing you said, the penetration, the oral sex, all of that, I had to do her, she had to do me. Not only that, it planted the seed in me of, am I now gay right. or am I now bisexual? Because right. this woman touched me and planted the seed of, now I'm looking at other women. And then I was like, mm, I don't really like women like that though. Like, yeah, try it, I'm good, I'm straight. Like, no. Nah. But again, somebody planted that seed of that confusion. Seed. And so we bear the shame of, uh, well, I don't really kind of know. And, you know, is it really rape? And is it really molestation? And at some point it actually felt good. And do you just, what, what do you do with all of that? Because I was confused on even how to define it because mine was not, she was still a child too, but she was older than me, but she wasn't 21. She wasn't like a grown woman. Uh -huh. So, you know, it's, it's the, is it rape? Is it molestation? Is it just two kids being bad? Like what, how do you even define that? I, um, later on, I mean, after eight or nine, you know, like I said, when I got to fifth grade and started such education, um, because he was an adult, um, I believe probably about 24 at that time. And I was mm -hmm. eight. Wow. Um, so that's when that other part of it clicked to me that it was definitely, you know, yeah, rape. It was definitely something I didn't want. It was definitely something that I tried to fight off. But like I said, he was six four. What was I going to do at eight years old with somebody that's six four? Well, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, but then and, part of it, part of it too, is I got to the point of suicide at probably thirteen or fourteen, with living with the secret of holding it and hiding it, and it literally became a weight. Like, oh yeah. I don't think I'll ever get free of this. I don't think I'll ever be able to talk about it. Let me just die now. Exactly. I go into that in my book, actually, yeah. um, about how I, I go into in my book, you're in my thoughts from the time that I was a child through my adulthood. Yes. You're in every single thought. So, yeah, I, it, that's definitely in there, too. Yeah. All right. We're going to come back, Maurice. Dale, what role did your parents play in leading up to the depression or suicidal thoughts? If any, for Jenna, it didn't play a part. Um. So for me, it was like, let me look into the camera. Um, for me, it was like more so my environment. Mm -hmm. um, growing up in the west side of Detroit, um, in the era that I did grow up, you weren't allowed to share anything in like school or amongst your friends or community, you know what I'm saying? Not to say that I, in, like, I uh, took on any type of abuse, mm -hmm. uh, like sexually or anything, I didn't. It was just the point that I didn't like a lot of the things that I saw in the community 
And it was mm-hmm. like, ah, oh, man, if you don't like this stuff, you're weak or you're gay. And I was like, bro, this none of this makes sense. Like, I'm living across the street from uh, drug addicts. I yeah. walk to school, I see prostitutes, I see dead bodies, I see gang members, I have people chase me, I'm getting jumped. And it's like, man, if you don't deal with this stuff, deal with this stuff, or you don't uh, follow this type of lifestyle, either you're, you're weak, according to your peers, you're weak wow. or you're gay as a man. So from, I would say, second grade up until 10th, 11th grade in high school, that's all I heard. And it was like, man, this is ridiculous because I don't have an outlet to let any of this out. Right. I feel like people didn't understand me that were older than me because they came from somewhere different, um, wow. a different generation. Um, and people that were around my age, I couldn't really tell them because they didn't understand. So yeah. what I turned to um, was Christ. And that made it worse because it was like, nobody even wanted to hear about Christ. So not now not only am I weak or gay, now I'm considered lame. So mm-hmm. it's like, okay, now the friends that I did have uh, are, are cut even short, shorter. So I may have had 10 people I considered friends and now it's down to four. Um, wow. So now I feel like I'm alone. I have no one to talk to and I have no outlet and yeah. I'm losing faith. So that's what it was for me. It was like, even if I could say it was something with my parents, uh, growing up with a single mother, I guess I look for uh, having time with my father that mm-hmm. I didn't get. Okay. And then when I actually was able to be around my father, it was a it was completely different than what I imagined it to be. Mm-hmm. So, with that never hitting my my um my mind or fulfilling my thoughts, where it was like, okay, this is how my dad is, and what I remember, this is who he will, who he will be, and this is what life will be like with my dad. That never really occurred. Never so it was like, okay, I don't have my dad to talk to now. I can't tell my mom about what's going on. Uh, I don't want to turn to the streets of Detroit because I never liked I never liked the environment what I what I saw going around. So what do I do? And that's where everything collapsed on me. And it was like, okay, I'm going to internalize everything and I'm going to try to deal with it myself because, wow. like you were saying about the guy that's six four, I'm six five. So I'm like, okay, I'm strong. You know. I'll, I'll be okay, like I'll get through it. I just have to get out of here and make it out of the city and I will be fine. Mm, wow. Boovarette, you loud and clear now, Boovarette. <laughs> All right. I'm back. I Hopefully I'm back. <laughs> In Jesus' name, <laughs> anoint your computer. All right. So the, the question is, um, the question is, uh, what role, if any, do you feel like your parents played, Bouverette, in the, the depression or the suicidal thoughts? Um, you know, f- for me, it, as I was saying when I got cut off, my internet dropped, um, you know, I, I lost my biological dad at the age of, I was actually 12, 12. almost mm-hmm. 13. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when, when you lose, and we see this in our society, when you lose that male figure, yes, you lose your identity as a teenager, especially coming into those years. Yes. And, you know, I was faced with not only the loss of a father at, at pivotal age, but now my mom is remarried a year later, a little wow. over a year later. And it, it was a, uh, and she, I'm not saying nothing she wouldn't, she wouldn't admit was truth. Yeah. It was yeah. a marriage of convenience. It was a marriage of necessity because she's here. She is with three children, one 12, going to be 13, the other two under the age of three. Wow. And so now here I am forced to accept a man that I don't know that's coming into my house, oh, my house, our house. And now is trying to be my father figure. And for me, I think that uh, the the lack of, and and I'm going to be very transparent with y'all tonight. Yeah, Um, come on. The lack of what I felt should be support from my mother in those pivotal years, Mm -hmm. because me and my my stepdad did not have a good relationship until the last about five years of his life, and they were married for 25 years. Okay. And for me, the lack of uh, nurturing from my mother mm-hmm. brought me into a place of not just identity crisis, but also um, not knowing who I was. 
Mm-hmm. And when you don't know who you are, yeah. here's the key. When you don't know who you are, you don't see any reason to try to figure it out. Be- because, you know, you're a teenager. I'm a teenager, you know, and all the way through my teenage years. And um, even to this day, and, and, and I'm, I'm sharing something that, that is very, uh, well, transparent. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, to this day, I love my mom. We, we talk. We don't have a bad relationship but we don't have a strong relationship. Okay. Two different things. Yep. And, and, and I don't mean that in a negative way or played against my mother, but there's just not that bond. And I really believe that it stems back to the lack of what I felt was nurturing in those pivotal years. I didn't have a relationship with my stepdad. And let me, let me mention, not only did he come, but he thought he brought three with him. Wow. I had two stepbrothers and a stepsister. Wow. And they had a very bad relationship with him over the years. Mm. So, so seeing their lack of relationship with him, I said, well, I, I'm just, I'm just a step kid. I, if they ain't got a relationship, <laughs> I most assuredly ain't going to have one. And yeah, I did it for many, many kid. years. Yeah. yeah. You know, and I, for many, many years. And so I think that for me, the, the lack of nurturing and the lack of connection uh, even into, and I can say, I can say this very, very transparently, even into like my late thirties, early forties with my mom still felt that lack, still felt that sense yeah. of disconnect. Yes. Uh, and it affected me, not just between me and her, but it affected me in ministry. Uh, yeah. you know, I, I could, I could never, um, it was difficult for me and this is going to sound really weird, but it was very difficult for me to receive any kind of direction from women in ministry. Mm. Okay. Um, even though I had a spiritual father and a spiritual mother, I was looking for uh, the the connection with the father. Wow. But I wasn't pursuing the connection with the mother because of the because I felt okay deep deep inside I said okay she's not gonna be able to nurture me my, my biological mom couldn't do it she's not gonna be able to do it so I'm okay with just having a dad. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, so for me that's how that played in for me. And, and, and I'm glad you said that because I think when we came to Oakland Church, I was, because we had just lost our bishop, I was looking for a father. I was not looking for a mother. And so while I love Pastor Amira to life, she's great. And I know I can call her. I, I needed that dad form of Pastor D. Like, that's yeah, what I yeah. needed when we came to Oakland Church. And, that, and that's what we have. You need a dad who is loving and daughter you know he's very nurturing to be a male he's very nurturing i want to jump to jen i want to jump to jenna jenna what would you say um what would you say to the people who say it's not that deep there are people who say you're tripping you're crazy um to be at the point of suicide it's just it ain't that deep because there are people who don't understand it. No, I think that the older I get, I, I realize that there are different, pretty much two different kinds of people. I think there are people who, um, what I call kind of like soldier people who work nine to five, who go with the flow. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there are people, I think like us, I think a lot of people who've been hurt they use that hurt for their testimony. It's their beauty for ashes kind of thing. Um, and I think that maybe if we hadn't been hurt, um, like listening to other stories here, um, we wouldn't be able to succeed because we wouldn't know how strong we are. Right. Um, we wouldn't have that overcoming kind of feeling. So, um, I mean, today, I think one of the things that helped me get out of depression was a gratitude journal that I started Mm -hmm. here on Thanksgiving, where you just, every day in November, you say something that you're grateful for. Uh, I think that that gratitude is what to this day helps me. And I'm grateful for every, um, I'm grateful for that part of my life because, Mm -hmm. you know, I know that I can overcome it and it it feels like it's my testimony. Maurice, what would you say to the people who don't understand it? They can't even fathom what it's like to be at the point of suicide or depression and considering taking your life. And they say, it ain't that deep. I would say that they've not experienced um, the thoughts that we yeah. experience. 
Yeah. I would say that they can't possibly know what it's like to um, live in darkness. Mm -hmm. Because to actually live in darkness, I think is like different from just like thinking about darkness, just like having dark thoughts. But Mm -hmm. like when you're actually living in darkness and you know the spirit of depression is over, you know that suicidal thoughts are like actually around you and spiritually you can feel it until you get to that dark place I don't think that it's possible for them to completely understand what it's like not saying that they haven't gone through things not saying that they won't go through things to bring them to that point prayerfully not Mm -hmm. but for someone to say that it's not that deep um first of all it's insensitive uh secondly uh, I don't want to call it ignorant but it kind of is because you never know Mm -hmm. what takes a person to that level because I would never say it but I could say to someone oh you were only touched I was penetrated you know to belittle someone's right story right you know you can never do that so for them to say that it's just like I don't know I don't don't understand but I would say to them that you don't understand yeah you know yeah that what it what it is like to actually live every day in darkness yeah and so, Bouveret, I want to switch to you, but kind of flip the question a bit. If I'm on, if I'm a family member or I'm a spouse and I'm helping someone who is battling depression or suicide, what do I do? Because if, if I can't, like my husband, he'll tell me all the time, I don't know what point of life, like he can't even fathom taking his own life ever. We are total mm-hmm. polar opposites. And so his thing is, yeah. I don't know how to support you when you get to that point. So what do you tell the person who's supporting the person who's suicidal or has depression? Well, I think it's very key to understand that, uh, and this can be a very bold statement. Yeah. But if you truly, truly, truly don't have the heart of Christ and the mind of Christ, you're never going to be able to do it properly. Mm. Because when, when you're dealing with someone that is having these thoughts and first of all let let me say this let me say this um you can't you can't say that it's not that deep because jesus experienced it in the garden of gethsemane yeah if you read the text in the original greek when it says that he prayed and he began to sweat droplets of blood science Mm -hmm. has proven that he was under such agony that the blood vessels under his skin started to break wow And, and when you're dealing with someone that is under that level of pressure, you know, G, I mean, we see two sides of Christ here. The father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, but your will be done. The cup, and here's the key to this. The cup was passing by him in that moment. And the reason he switched from a Hebraic understanding of this text, as I studied the Hebrew, from a Hebraic understanding, when he switched was when he said, Father, I don't want to do this. And the cup was, God was allowing him to see in the cup the destiny that sat before him, which was you and I. Mm-hmm. That's why he switched. He said, let this cup pass from me. The, the cup of bearing somebody else's burden. And until we really have the compassion and the love of Christ manifesting our life naturally, we're never going to be able to do it properly. Now, wow. how do you, what do you say to someone that is at that level? Your mm-hmm. job is not to try to talk them out of it. Your job, ah, catch this. Your, I'm trying not to preach this. <laughs> your job, your job in my, not, let me rephrase. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Our assignment in that season is not to try to stop them, but to get them to see their identity as Christ sees them. Because when mm-hmm. you, when, when they begin to see themselves as Christ sees them, hope begins to come into their life again. That's right. And so, so in the, at that time, you have to be very careful about what you say. Your words have to be words of love. They have to be words of encouragement. They have to be words of hope because you're dealing with someone that is hopeless. Yes. So if you come in there saying, well, you know, that's just a selfish thing to do. They're going to be like, okay. And, 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 right. And, yeah. You you know what I mean? And, and, and we had that discussion last week about, about, you know, the viewpoint of it being a selfless, you know, it's a selfish thing. We can't yeah. say that. So, so I think that for people that are dealing with, you whether it be children, teenagers, adults, whatever the case would be, uh, uh, someone that's dealing with suicidal thoughts, 
you really need to pray that you have the mind of Christ and the mouth of Christ, because yeah. anything outside of that is not going, it's not going to operate and it's not going to function. And I know I'm coming from a very spiritual side on this, but, but that is the reality of it. Now, if you're watching this tonight and you say, well, I, I'm not really a church goer. Listen, when you go to church or not, God hears your prayer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, and Boobra, I'll say this. I do believe that my husband has the heart of Christ. Right. I don't know that he has the mind and the words of Christ because mm -hmm. at those times he'll say, we're fine. We're going to make it. You're good. It's okay. And I'm like, mm -hmm. no, it's not. Okay. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. I don't feel like I'm going to make it like in that dark time. I really feel like there's nothing more for me. God is done using me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is it. Yeah. Like and and see, and, and see what, 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 what your husband's doing. And I know your husband, I love your husband. I know his heart. Yeah. yeah. And so, so you can have the best heart, but here's the reality of it. Um, when we, when we say those types of things, we're going to be okay. You cannot inflect your own personal drive on somebody else. Got it. And so what you have to do in that time is you have to pray Holy Spirit, give me the words to speak. And, and, and you have to keep, we have to keep us out of the mix of the conversation. Mm -hmm. Because now what we're doing is when we, and, and I'm going to go psychological on, on us all here, psychology 101, is when we do that, we now are making that person think that we're trying to compare them to us. Well, and I, I think in fairness, what people do is they're trying to include the spouse or think about your kids yeah. or think about your spouse or think yeah. about your job and think about all the people who are going to miss you. Yeah, Jenna. I think, though, in this situation, because he's your husband, I think that he sees your value and he sees mm -hmm. that you have a great life. He doesn't comprehend how you feel because he sees you the way that you don't see you. Does that make exactly. sense? I'd agree. Exactly, which was which was to Bouverat's point. I have to see myself as Christ and my husband and everybody sees me and it took years to get there. I do now, but at 14 and at 21, I'm like, live for what, yo? Like, this pain is great. Like, live for who? Like, you can, I can't imagine what somebody like Kate Spade went through because society will look at it and say, she had all of these purses and designs and stores and international and gone. Mm -hmm. It wasn't enough. So I, I know I know to the person who's watching this that's in poverty and living paycheck to paycheck and they don't know how they're gonna get gas money to go to work next week. They think the issue is money. The issue is not money. The issue is mindset. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times we think if we get more money, we'll be okay. No, when you get more money, you'll spend more money. Ask me how I know. <laughs> you looking at her, like the more money I get, I'll be like, I need another t-shirt. Let me go get this. Let me get three watches, not one, three. I got two wrists, three watches. Yeah. So I, th I, think, it's, I think it's interesting. That's why I was asking like, Hoover at what the person can do to support because the people who have to support these people, whether it's a spouse or a parent, they don't know what to say. They don't know what to do. And if the person is not open to getting counseling, what, what do they have? In, in a situation like that, let me jump in and, and, and interject on that point right yeah. there. In a situation like that, um, you know, it's again, it's important to understand that their thought processes at that point are not, are not normal thought processes. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and I think that we, 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 we in, in the church world, especially the charismatic Pentecostal world, we want, we want to attach a spirit to everything. And, yes. and I'm not saying, we talked about this last time. I'm not yes. saying that, that there's not a spirit behind this at times, but, but you have to understand a person's mental capacity and mental state at that point. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, if, if you're dealing with somebody that has emotional instability and yes. they're unstable in their life, um, you need to know to the extent of what you can do and what you can't do. Yeah. And, and sometimes your help is calling in someone or calling, calling somebody that can help 
because maybe you can't help if that makes yeah. sense. That's good. And so, so you, you have to, you have to always be careful. There are some assignments in our lives that we think are our assignments, but aren't our assignments. We're That's to good. point to the assignment. Mm. And, and so, especially in a marriage situation, you know, we've been brought up with the philosophy and I'm not saying it was completely wrong. It wasn't tweaked quite enough. We've been brought up for you. The reality of it is you can't. Mm -hmm. And you need to go to somebody that, that you trust, that's not your spouse, that you can pour out your heart to because we all know that sometimes in our own mind we play out how things are going to end up if we if we say this yeah so i think we have to in a situation where we're dealing with somebody that is having these thoughts and de yeah. and struggling with this um we have to understand we have to understand how the mind works and we have to understand how you know when to when to come in and when mm -hmm. to back off. Yeah. I'm and when to point to, to another direction. And when to point. I'm, I'm pointing to Maurice. Maurice, quick quick question before you chime in. And then you can kind of put in the comment too. My question is, to the person who's watching that doesn't have hope, to the person that's watching that's depressed, they don't feel like anything is going to get better than it is today. They don't see themselves as like Bouverette said, as Christ sees them. Um, what do you say, number one, to get them to speak out or pull them up and out tonight? I would say to them that whether they know it or not, they have a purpose mm -hmm. in this earth. I would say to them that they were created with a purpose um, and to not give up because, because God gave you a purpose, it's meant for you to fulfill that purpose. So mm -hmm. until that purpose is fulfilled, um, I would say to them to um, find somebody like um, the apostle was saying, find somebody that they can talk to that actually listens. Uh, yeah. Because a, a lot of times I found out going through therapy and going through the different mental institutions that I went mm -hmm. through, everybody had an answer, but nobody really listened mm. to me. Until I got to like the last facility where there was a chaplain and there was a pastor. As soon as I walked into the facility, I knew that it was for me. I don't know how, but that chaplain actually listened to me. And it wasn't until he actually listened, because like I said, the therapist and sometimes our family members or our spouses, they'll always have an answer for what we're dealing with, but they don't really know. So I would say to someone who's dealing with that today to try and find somebody who will actually listen to you, who will hear your heart, who will allow you to pour out, who won't judge you while you're talking, who will give you that space, that mental space to just yeah. actually get to that root cause of what brought you to that point. Yeah. And yeah. To, I would tell them that they can make it, that it gets better. It does. It, it gets better. It, it doesn't seem it does. like it, but life gets better. And for me to, to hear myself saying that, I get overjoyed because I, I never thought I would ever say that again in my life. But it gets better. It gets better. And I'm, and I'm so glad you said that, Maurice, because now the enemy can't threaten me with it will never get better than this because I've seen too many times it gets better. It does. And it's sweeter. It's so sweet on the other side of it that, yeah, I remember that stuff, but this over here is like Listen, good, good, like great, great. I've never experienced, like going through the things that I, I uh, experienced for those 27 years, I had moments of happiness. And mm -hmm. I can't say that my entire life was depression, even though I had, I dealt with mm -hmm. those depression those uh thoughts like on a daily basis i did have points of happiness yeah. but now i can say i have like joy and there's a difference between there's a difference happiness and joy, and joy. like yeah i it probably wasn't until like last year a year before last like when i really started writing the book and opening up 
it's where I found like I just woke up one day. I can't even say it was like something. I know it was God. I can't say it was yeah. anybody else but God. I just literally yeah. woke up one day and there was just this weight lifted. I noticed mm-hmm. the depression gone. I noticed those suicidal thoughts gone. I noticed yeah. the weight lifted and it was something that I cannot describe to yeah. anybody. I yeah. know it was God. So, I mean. And, and Maurice, I, I know we said it gets better, um, but one of the things the enemy will try and throw at me now is what you're living in is too good to be true. Cause at <laughs> times that's what it feels like. Like I'm, books, yeah, books, stage plays, uh, films, speaking, like me and my husband, marriage ministry, like, yeah, like not being in a house where we yelling and screaming and throwing shoes at each yeah. other, like living like the Huxtables in real life. Like <laughs> we can eat at a table and laugh and joke like a family where they do that at in the black community. Like, right. you know what I'm saying? So then the, then the threat is, oh, there's going to be a sudden boom or there's going to be a sudden accident and everything's going to come crashing down. And That's yeah. where I am right now. Yeah, That's so it's like, God, is this real? Like this, how long is it going to last? And when do you revert <laughs> back to the old bad? You know what I'm saying? Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah, Jenna, yeah. what would you say um, to the person who's watching they, they don't have hope. Um, we kind of talked about this last week. Maurice, you weren't here last week, but we kind of talked about the person. Um, the poorest person in the world is not the person who has the least amount of money in their bank account. It's he or she who has lost hope. Um, and so I want Jenna to speak to the people who may be listening that may have lost hope um, about what their process may look like to speak out about it, to seek help, um, and what they should do. Um, I think this kind of goes back to what you were talking about last week about being selfish um, just a little bit. Um, For me, I think what could offer people hope, and this is what I thought about a bunch, um, and this happened with the gratitude journal, uh, thinking about just the things that I truly enjoy in life. And these, among these things are Target, um, Chick-fil-A, and I know this sounds strange right now, um, country music, I love country music. So (laughs) I was thinking... (laughs) I was thinking, um, how many stories have you heard about people who just, especially celebrities, um, you know, you read a lot about Marilyn Monroe and and people like this who had a very difficult life, very depressed, um, very emotional life. But can you imagine a world without these people? Like these people push through, um, especially a lot of musicians and singers, people who've been shot. And um, I mean, even like JK Rowling, I've never done the Harry Potter stuff because my mom thought it would send me to hell. Yeah. But um but apparently, look at the success of it. Right. Like she was on welfare like while she was yep. sending her book to agents and now you know it's a cultural phenomenon. There's there's a whole and movies life. and books and right. and, and it brings people and, joy. So yeah. um, she had a purpose. Yeah. I think um you just have to look for your purpose. You've got to fight through it because if you give up now you're taking uh, whatever gift God gave you, whatever talents God gave you away from the world. Um, So I kind of look at it in that way. Like if I give up or if I had given up, you know, what would the world be without? Yeah. Even though I don't see that I, you know, sometimes when I'm not feeling good that I I can accomplish anything, but I believe that that's what these people felt too. Yeah. I think that everyone felt that way at some point. Yeah. And so if I could say one thing, just one thing, it would be, find the problem that you are in the earth to solve. Right. Because I do believe that we all are here placed strategically for this time, for this season. Yes, in the midst of COVID, there were some people who died before COVID. There were some people who were born and died before COVID. Some people were born in the midst of COVID. Can you imagine the babies coming into life now? Like (laughs) you born in the middle of a pandemic, like that's history making. Right. But literally, I know that we are here for the times and seasons. Like, I don't know if you all listen to um, Dr. Matthew Stevenson out of Chicago, but he says great men and women were born for the time when they were needed the most. Mm -hmm. And so I believe that God placed us here for the time that he needed us here the most. So what problem are we here to solve? And when you find that one problem, you solve it over and over and over again, because you do it seamlessly and easily, and you'll be unstoppable because nobody can tell you you don't have purpose because you already know what your purpose is. It's like a pen. I know the purpose. Now it can be a weapon, but a pen's (laughs) purpose is to write. Now you can can use me for a lot of different things, 
but what is my original intent? What was the original intent when God placed me in the earth? Yeah. Any final words, Jenna? I don't think so. Um, okay. I think that the one thing, I, I don't think that, I think when you're depressed, a lot of times you depend on the people that you love to get, pull you out of it. Yeah. Um, and they can't. They can't. And years ago, I don't know if it was Oprah or Dr. Phil or someone like that said that for every negative thing that's said to you, it takes like a thousand positive things to yep. just to bring you back to balance. Yep. So I if, and I think that if you're putting your depression on other people, if, if you're, if you have a friend or someone that you can open up to or a spouse, I think that sometimes you can exhaust them because they don't know what to do. Yeah. Um, but I think that if you're trying to pull someone out that you just have to positive reinforcements over and over and over and like I said I did the Joel Olstein book on tape and yeah. I had to do it over and over and over until it broke through and and cracked open yeah. my black heart and um yeah. and made me be able to um feel things again yeah it takes yeah. a lot that's of work true. that's real it takes a lot of work but you know what it took a lot of work we weren't involved in the work of planting the seed but somebody had to plant that seed and water it and till it and over and over again for it to be a root, and now we got to work to uproot it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what would you say, Maurice, final words? Um, one thing that sticks out right now in my brain, and I hope it uh, helps someone like it helped me. I had a very best friend to pass away like five years ago. Um, I actually depended on him since I was like 18 years old. He was always like on me, on me, on me. You're going to do this, you're going to do that. Don't give up, you know. And wow. one thing he said to me before he passed away, he said something that he heard from Miles Monroe. He said, Maurice, die empty. That's he it. Said, Don't you leave this earth until everything that God put in you comes out. Until yeah. you are fulfilling your purpose in this life, until everything in you comes out. Because the first thing I thought about was what I went through. How could it help somebody? That's why I wrote the book. At first, it started off as a journal. I was just going to keep it to myself. It was therapeutic. I was just going to leave it. But I felt like if I could help somebody, you know, yeah. so I would tell somebody who may not know what their purpose is because you have a purpose, something is in you that can bless somebody else. Mm -hmm. Die empty, let it all out. I don't care how crazy it sounds. I don't care how crazy it seems. I don't care how discouraged you may be. I want to encourage yeah. you that you have something in you for somebody else. That's right. So stay on, stay, stay the course. Yeah. Finish strong. You can, you can make yeah. it. Yeah. No, that's huge. I want to thank y'all tonight. Um, we did have other guests, technical difficulties, phones dying, Wi-Fi, you know, the enemy be trying to come in. We're going to get this word out and this word of encouragement no matter what. I want to thank you, Jenna, for joining me again all the way from wherever the heck you are now, King Street, South Carolina, <laughs> North Carolina, South, South Carolina. South Carolina. <laughs> and Maurice, you in Flint, right? Yes. Thank you for having me. Yes, Flint, Michigan. Tell us where we can get the book, Maurice. Go to um, Amazon, Amazon.com. And if you type okay. in the, the Great Endurance by Maurice Mitchell, it should pop up. The Great Endurance. All right. Yeah. And I'm waiting to get the website copy because I need you to sign yes. it for me. That's I yes. want the Amazon copy. Okay. I got you covered. <laughs> I got you covered. <laughs> Jenna, you have a website or business or anything where people can find out more about you? I don't have a website. Nope. Not okay. yet. I will. Right. It's coming. It's coming. <laughs> it's coming. All right. I love you all. Thanks so much for joining me Thank tonight. You. We will see you on the next edition of Uncut. Talk to y'all soon. Thanks. Blessings. Bye bye.